in Greece and the United Kingdom, where our speaker is today. Kalimera for those in the United States, where I am based right now and in, Bo in Boston. Hello and welcome to our virtual lecture series, the first one for 2023. As uh, many of you may know, I'm sure you know, uh, Greece is a popular tourist destination for its various attributes, its sunny climate, its beautiful beaches, its rich cultural and historical heritage. However, the country's reliance on tourism as a significant source of revenue has also led to several sustainability issues, uh, particularly on the Greek islands, raising concerns about the long-term impact of over-exploitation of the landscape for tourist reasons, uh, bringing about what is known as the tragedy of the commons which is the title of today's talk. Um, the myopic, uh, short-sighted uh, over-exploitation of today's uh, grass of the commons uh, for uh, which will uh, prevent future, um, uh, future generations from being able to, um, to have that same benefit. Our guest speaker, Professor Stathis Kalivas, a well-known um, political scientist will discuss the impact of tourism on Greece's landscape and its potential consequences. The title of his lecture, as I said, is The, the Tragedy of the Commons. Stathis is a professor of government at the uh, Department of Political and International Relations of the University of Oxford. He holds the uh, Gladstone uh, chair, the oldest chair of political science in Great Britain, and is a fellow at the All Souls College of Oxford. Uh, he obtained his BA from the University of Athens in 1986, and then he got his uh, MA and his PhD from the University of Chicago, all in political science. He taught at Ohio State University, at New York University, at the University of Chicago, and from 2000, 2003 to 2017, he was a professor of politics at Yale, where he founded and ran a program for the study of order, conflict, and violence, the main areas of his research. He joined Oxford in 2018. Kalivas is the author of many books um, and over 50 scholarly articles in five languages. His work has received several awards, has been recognized internationally, and has been featured in various media outlets. Uh, those of you in Greece, um, I'm sure had the benefit of seeing his, uh, uh, the, 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 the TV rendition of his uh, book called uh, uh, Disasters and Triumphs, uh, which in Greek is called Katastrophes Kefriamvi. Um, and it was a seven part series um, of, of Greek history uh, on, on Sky Television, uh, uh, basically describing the um, hot, cold shower that uh, is the way to describe uh, <laughs> the modern, modern Greek history um, since the um, creation of the uh, modern Greek state. His research has been supported by many foundations. Um, Professor Kalivas, Thank you for being here with us. Uh, and let me just say a couple of um, household things here. Um, there is a slight uh, change in today's lecture. Unfortunately, due to personal to a personal emergency, our uh, uh, discussant, Dr. Uh, Irini Karamuzi, uh, will not be able to participate in today's event. So I've been I've been um, I've been uh, colored. Uh, I've been uh, mobilized to serve as the discussant at that moment. So uh, before I pass the floor to, uh, uh, to the Sathi, um, I, let me say that you can send your questions at the end um, using the chat box at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and when he concludes his presentation, we will get to as many questions as possible. 
given the allotted time for this lecture, which is one hour. May I, may I remind you all that this is being recorded. Uh, and it's, 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 it's great for those who haven't been able to uh, listen in today and for those who may want to uh, join our lecture series are very, very um, successful virtual lecture series in the future. Um, and the discussion will be saved in and archived in this way. So anybody who does not want to uh, be seen recorded should switch off their video cameras. Um, Professor Kalivas, it's a pleasure to have you with us today. Thank you for accepting our invitation uh, to participate in this uh, series. The floor, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Um, let me say by way of introduction, um, just a couple of words about why um, I've been uh, thinking about this issue. I'm not a specialist uh, on tourism. Uh, there is a field actually called tourism studies um, that, that specializes in the study uh, of tourism flows and uh, its kinds and uh, its impacts. I'm a political scientist. I study conflicts, but I, I'm also very interested in Greece. Uh, so I've been uh, spending quite a lot of time uh, thinking about Greek issues, primarily Greek politics, obviously, but also Greek, modern Greek history. I became very interested in, in the question of um, tourism uh, its, uh, and its impact, uh, just as, as a regular person visiting Greece and observing uh, how tourism is changing and how it is changing uh, the country. Uh, and so um, out of um, just this process of observation, I decided last summer to write a piece which was published in Kathimerini, both in Greek and in English, and, and actually um, provoked um, quite a lot of debate. A lot of people have been thinking, it turns out, um, along the same lines. Uh, and so uh, that encouraged me to look into it a bit more. Um, I haven't completed um, my research on this topic, but I uh, explored a number of aspects of it. And so, um, and I think there are some interesting messages to, uh, to actually share uh, about that. But this is very, very preliminary. And so I'll just give you um, an overview of my, of my thoughts uh, so far. Um, so let me share my screen. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the tragedy, of, uh, the tragedy of the commons, which is actually only one uh, of the problems, as we're going to see uh, with, with tourism um, and Greece. So let me give you uh, some facts about tourism. Um, it's a key sector. Uh, for the Greek economy, especially uh, during the crisis, its importance uh, increased both because other sectors declined and because tourism itself uh, increased. Uh, it is producing about 13% of, of Greeks, Greece's GDP. Uh, it uh, amounts to about 20% of uh, its total export. It's an export industry because yeah, in fact, it, it is attracting um, funds from uh, outside of Greece. And it also, um, depending on how one calculates, uh, accounts for about 17% of total employment. And there are various wage, ways in which one can calculate the indirect effect. Um, one of the things that's uh, quite interesting is that it's a, it's a seasonal um, um, industry. 80% uh, of arrivals and 85% of revenue uh, concentrates uh, in the period between April and September of each year. Um, Let's look at a few trends. Um, it is you know, difficult to believe that in 1980, which is not very far away in the past, uh, Greece attracted about 350,000 uh, arrivals. Um, if we go uh, to 1998, we see an, a tremendous growth in just a matter of 20 years uh, from less than a million to 11 million. So it's an 11 times um, increase in just a matter of 20 years, so beyond exponential. Uh, and then it stabilized. Uh, 2004, the year of the Olympic Games, uh, Greece attracted 13 million um, arrivals. 2010, um, around the same level, uh, 15 million. So there was a stabilization and there was concern. In fact, I was looking at various reports that were produced uh, in the mid um, 2010s and there was concern that uh, the trend uh, had stabilized. Uh, this is a chart that was produced in 2010. Uh, you can see how uh, from 1981, 
which is listed here as uh, you know five million. Uh, with, it's a different way of counting. Uh, you get to the point in which uh, there are about fifteen million arrivals in two thousand ten, and 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 this is a projection. The idea was to try to do a naive linear projection. If nothing interfered, the question was uh, what would be um, the total number of arrivals in Greece in, two, in, in 2020, so 10 years into the future. The prediction was it was going to be just over 20 million. Uh, in 2015, it was already 26 million. Uh, 2019, which is the record year, 30, 30, 31 million. Um, 2020 was the year of the uh, pandemic, uh, very limited tourism. Um, it's considered the year of the collapse. In fact, it went back to 1990 levels. So the collapse of tourism in 2020 actually means that we're back to where tourism was in 1990, which is not very, very much back in the past. Uh, and 2022 basically erased uh, the pandemic losses. We got back to the levels of uh, 2000. Uh, 19 about 30 30 to 31 million arrivals um what is very interesting about 2022 it excludes china because as you know the chinese uh, were not traveling so uh whereas that was the case back in 2019 uh so that gives you a sense uh, of the dynamic of the phenomenon which certainly has a very strong exponential logic in it uh, we're talking about a process uh, of uh, increase, which is not li just linear. Uh, is this a trend? Um, Greece is not unique in this respect. We're talking about the global trend in which more people than ever uh, wish to travel and visit other countries. Um, uh, and so we shouldn't be celebrating. It's not that Greece is doing something right and is attracting more people. It is just um, attracting uh, its normal share of a growing um, size, a phenomenon that is um, developing very quickly. Um, I think that the bigger source of this growth is twofold. Uh, and the most important factor is that the world is becoming richer. Uh, there is a new global uh, middle and upper class uh, in countries which in the past were not part of the tourism industry. If you look at all the reports, um, up until recently, the majority uh, of visitors in Greece came from Western Europe. Uh, then um, we have a very substantial addition of Eastern, Central and Eastern Europe, post-Soviet countries. On top of it, we have a, a very substantial increase of North American tourists. And uh, we also have, um, tourists uh, from the so-called global south, from Latin America, from the Middle East, from India, uh, from um, China, of course, and uh, even from Africa. Um, uh, I live, uh, when I'm in Greece, I live in central Athens. Uh, I have, there are several Airbnbs in, in my building. I very often meet uh, tourists from uh, Nigeria, for example. Um, and this, I think, if there is one, a single takeaway you have to keep with you is, I think, this, uh, that because more and more people in the world wish to travel, um, it's inevitable, um, everything else equal, of course, that more and more people are going to come to Greece. Because Greece is a very attractive part of the um, destinations. Um, and because traveling and tourism is a consumer good that's associated uh, with um, the tradition of, of middle class that uh, people from other countries, other parts of the globe wish to emulate. Now, on top of it, and what explains the tremendous growth after the mid 2010s is of course technology. Uh, two features, the fact that uh, traveling is becoming cheaper uh, and also technology is making traveling both uh, more feasible and also more desirable. Uh, things like Instagram, social media, all of that is attracting uh, and making the, um, the idea of traveling and visiting other places um, something that's more attractive. So the question is not whether tourism is going to grow, uh, but how quickly it's going to grow. The growth, I think, is a given. And if we were to extrapolate the current trends uh, over the last 40 years, uh, my sense is that in the next 10 years, we're likely to see another doubling 
uh, of the number of visitors to Greece. If um, Greece is attracting right now about 30 million, that means that in 10 years, we're likely to see 60 million people coming to Greece. There is, of course, the, the very great question of how climate change uh, may um, affect tourism in general. And this is not an easy question to answer uh, because we do not know how quickly things are going to change and we're not able to evaluate exactly what the effects of that change are going to be. So I'm going to bracket that off. Uh, in a sense, if climate change proved to, proves to be catastrophic, in the next few years, obviously that is going to affect tourists, but of course, everything is going to be affected very negatively and the problems we're going to discuss today are no longer going to apply uh, and nobody uh, would worry very much about tourism. So I'm going to bracket climate change off, assume that things somehow will follow the current trajectory and uh, everything that I'm going to say from now on um, is based on that assumption. Let me give you very quickly some key features of the Greek uh, tourist industry. It's primarily a small business sector, even though there are large companies becoming very active. Uh, the majority of the service is provided by small businesses, usually family oriented. And in that respect, tourism reflects the structure of the Greek economy. As I mentioned, it's temporarily concentrated um, in the summer, and it's also regionally concentrated. We're talking about uh, a certain number of areas, and especially the coast uh, of Greece, uh, which is um, uh, catering to tourism. Uh, and uh, in the last 10 years, we've also witnessed the emergence of Athens as an independent destination. It used to be in the past that Athens was uh, a way uh, for, for visitors a stop uh, to, their, to the islands or to other destinations. Athens has become an all year destination now, and, and one which is very often uh, independent uh, of the islands or other destinations. People are coming to Athens for weekends, uh, for short visits, uh, or even for longer visits, uh, in spite of the fact that I said that still uh, the majority uh, of, the, of the visits are concentrated in the summer. One of the, uh, probably one of the uh, implications of the uh, revolution uh, in, world, in, in work habits is going to be the fact that we're going to see people traveling outside of the traditional summer season much more often uh, as well. And we, as I said, we are already witnessing that in Athens where in fact, a lot of the uh, people in the tourist business uh, are speaking of um, a one season. Uh, eventually the entire year is becoming a tourist season. So what's not to like um, about all of that? Um, uh, that is bringing more revenue to Greece. Greece re is, is cash strapped. Uh, it's coming out of a very big crisis. Um, employment uh, uh, is directly related to tourism. Um, there are, I think, three issues to highlight. The first may be described as um, a resource curse. The second one as a resource strain. And the third one, as a process of social exclusion. So let me discuss those three issues and uh, then I'm going to also discuss a few ideas about how to respond to those before we uh, turn into um, uh, the Q&A uh, session. The first one, uh, which is not very often discussed in Greece, is the problem of uh, the resource curse. Um, in a sense, natural beauty and history uh, are very much like a natural resource. They're a bit like um, oil or um, gold, it's something that you can actually harvest uh, with minimal additional investments and sell. Um, and this is a problem um, economists have discovered uh, because usually when uh, you, your economy depends too much on a natural resource that creates a set uh, of negative consequences, um, uh, including very weak institutions because you don't have to create strong institutions in order to create a strong economy that is going to produce goods directly. You depend very much on something that's easy uh, to harvest. And the second problem is the so-called Dutch disease is uh, you get flooded with uh, easy revenue uh, that in a sense makes you much less likely to innovate. Uh, so there is a problem if Greece, Greece's economy becomes overly dependent on tourism as the current trend looks like, if more, um, say, creative and smart people get attracted to an industry that requires 
you know, essentially low skills, uh, then the problem is um, that Greece's economy is going to be extremely vulnerable to the resource curse. Uh, the second problem, of course, and the one that, re that, that, that gets most dis discussed is the question of um, uh, the sort of resource strain. This is a picture from the Parthenon, which uh, in a single day last summer attracted uh, about over 16,000 visitors just in one day. So the demand uh, for uh, the most popular sites in Greece uh, is becoming very, very high. Um, this is known as uh, mass and sometimes uh, hyper tourism. Uh, and that is uh, associated with the tragedy of the commons. Uh, it's associated with the idea of sustainability. Tourism may become not sustainable uh, if the current trends continue. Uh, uh, there is a, a notion of carrying capacity that uh, certain places uh, even certain countries can only absorb uh, a certain number uh, of visitors, uh, a certain level of strain. Uh, that is having a direct effect on infrastructure, things like airports, roads, uh, even beaches, uh, or the ability, especially in very sensitive ecosystems like the islands in the cyclones and elsewhere, uh, the capacity to, for example, process garbage um, uh, is very much a function of how many people are using uh, uh, those, in, you know, this infrastructure. The idea of the tragedy of the commons is that this is likely to produce a degradation of the experience of, of tourists, is going to destroy local culture, um, it's going to destroy the environment, and, and eventually the argument goes that actually may chase uh, tourists away because there's not going to be something nice about visiting Greece it's in a sense destroying the, um, uh, the the very process that generates the product you're selling. Um, I don't think that's necessarily correct. One of the things that we are seeing is that in places in which the experience uh, of tourism is becoming worse, rather than uh, chasing tourists away, we have a phenomenon of attracting uh, lower quality tourism. Uh, there are lots of people who are willing uh, to visit places that seem to be uh, uh, under tremendous strain. They do not necessarily care about the crowds. Uh, places um, like uh, Venice or Barcelona have not really been affected by the fact that the tourist experience has been um, uh, pretty um, degraded compared to what it used to be in the past. Uh, of course, that is uh, a very bad outcome. Uh, economically, you can still generate income, uh, but you generate less income, you strain your resources enormously, and of course, um, that has a terrible effect on the environment and the culture of the country. That is the question, I think, um, and if there is a second takeaway that I want to emphasize is the fact that um, um, yeah, hyper-tourism is not necessarily a tragedy of the commons uh, problem in the narrow sense of the word, because you are going to still generate um, a lot of influx. The third problem, which is illustrated by um, this uh, villa, newly built villa in the, in the island of Paros, which as you can see is enormous, uh, is what may be described as um, an exclusion uh, process. Um, and I think that's also not very well recognized in Greece today. In fact, the idea here um, is that if we can reduce the number of arrivals and increase uh, the revenue that we can extract from the people who visit Greece, in effect, we have solved the problem. From for many years, um, there has been on on the you know, I would say one of the top uh, items on the wish list in Greece has been um, the um, attraction uh, of visitors uh, at a higher income scale. So the idea is you get fewer people, but you get wealthier people. Uh, and so it's, it's a, the idea is that this is an acceptable trade-off. It's a good thing, uh, actually, to achieve that. Uh, if only we can manage uh, this kind of transition, we've solved the problem. Um, and so the third takeaway here is that that's not necessarily correct uh, for a number of reasons. Um, it's not clear, for example, uh, that uh, focusing uh, on... Um, higher income tourists uh, is going to produce less strain uh, for at least two reasons. 
The first reason is that the number uh, of extremely wealthy people, even though it's not uh, as a proportion is small, uh, in terms of numbers, uh, those people tend uh, to be um, quite substantial around the world. Um, one of the things that um, really struck me uh, this past summer was um, uh, visiting a friend in the island of Tinos in an area that is becoming uh, very popular with uh, very wealthy people uh, and meeting uh, a millionaire from Ghana. Uh, Ghana is a country in Africa. Uh, so there are wealthy people um, across the world uh, and there are many of them. Uh, so it's not the case that limiting the number of visitors uh, will make Greece uh, a place in which there's not going to be strain. The second aspect is that um, these people very often uh, like to have very large houses and also use services that are also uh, very costly for the environment. Very large yachts, one of the, of the features of the Greek um, Aegean Sea, for example, for those of you who visit, is the fact that yachts seem to be not just proliferating, but also increasing in size enormously. And the same is true about um, private jets. Uh, you can replace charters with private jets, but their numbers are increasing. One of the trends that I've noticed from the data that I've looked at uh, in the past summer is the number of people who are arriving in Greece via private jet is increasing very much. Uh, the use of helicopters, the use of other means uh, of uh, mobility is also increasing. Um, it is in many places in Greece, it's becoming difficult to swim in the sea um, unprotected because there are so many um, fast um, um, uh, ships um, moving around. Uh, and all of that, uh, in a sense, points to a direction in which even having fewer and wealthier visitors does not mean that you will have less, um, in a sense, less damage on the environment. Uh, in fact, you could argue uh, that people who spend less money and stay in very small rooms cause less damage uh, on the environment than people who require very large villas. Uh, and there is another aspect which I think is very important, which is a sort of gentrification-like effect, which is uh, that eventually uh, the um, use of um, areas um, uh, by very wealthy visitors is going to make it impossible for less wealthy visitors uh, to be there, and that includes Greeks. Uh, and that is an aspect that has not really been uh, discussed very much. And I think it's very consequential for Greece. Uh, and the reason for that is that um, part of the Greek identity, uh, at least since the 1960s and 70s, uh, is the uh, importance uh, of access to the sea and the idea of summer holidays. Uh, in fact, the idea of the Greek summer, um, it, the Greek summer is a term that uh, I've looked at other cultures uh, uh, and I've been unable to locate, for example, concepts like an Italian summer or a Spanish summer uh, or a Croatian summer. It's a concept that's, uh, I think, very uh, unusual, uh, very central to Greek culture. The idea, uh, especially during the financial crisis of, of the past decade, uh, that no matter what, no matter how much strain, at the end of the day, there is a possibility for most Greeks, no matter what their financial status and their income level, to have access to the sea. I think that is likely uh, not only to change, but uh, eventually to disappear. And not just for people at lower levels of income, of the income scale, uh, even people, for example, who, have, um, who own property are going to be uh, so much attracted by the possibility of renting that property to uh, foreign visitors that they themselves are going to be uh, priced out essentially uh, of that activity. And I think losing that um, is going to cause um, a pretty substantial psychological uh, shock uh, to Greek society, which uh, has been essentially very much uh, associated with this idea. So three problems, uh, the resource curse, the resource strain, uh, and uh, the process of social exclusion. So what can we do about that given as I said, that the trend seems to be very much in the direction, not just of um, uh, stabilization, but it's going to be, and not just a linear increase, but probably um, uh, an exponential one. I think the first and more, most important step 
uh, is to um, affect a mental shift. Uh, what do I mean by that? Uh, we have to realize that uh, the trends, uh, the number of visitors, uh, uh, the process is going to just continue. Uh, and the damage, the threefold damage that I've described uh, is only likely to grow with it. Uh, and so we need to shift away in Greece, I think, from a logic of permanent expansion, which has been, I think, dominant in the minds of both policymakers and the population at large. Every uh, year, people are looking at the numbers of tourist arrivals and celebrating whenever they see larger numbers. Uh, this has been understandable uh, until now for economic reasons, but certainly I think this is something um, that we need to shift away um, uh, because precisely the rise in numbers is going to reach a point very, very soon in which the cost is going to exceed the benefit. Uh, oops, I'm sorry. The second thing is uh, we need to shift away from the idea that the Greek coastline is infinite uh, and that there, uh, there is going to be room for everyone. Um, one of the reactions I got from the uh, article I published in the summer well, was people saying, um, okay, so Mykonos and Santorini, uh, let's leave those places for foreigners, uh, for wealthy people. Um, we can just, you know, try to find beaches in uh, islands that are less popular, or perhaps uh, the mainland. Uh, this is not going to be the case. Uh, the Greek coastline is, is large, uh, but certainly not infinite. You can see the same trends taking place in the Ionian Islands. You can see the same trend taking place, for example, in the Peloponnese. Places like Messenia, which a few years uh, ago were um, basically unknown to foreign tourists have become right now uh, overtaken by it uh, and inaccessible uh, for a lot of um, average Greeks. Uh, we also need to shift away from the idea uh, that the solution is going to be in the expansion of the tourist season and the expansion of destinations. These things are going to happen anyway, um, I would um, argue. Uh, the tourist season is going to expand very much uh, independent of what we do and the destinations that are accessible uh, and desirable are going to increase as well. Uh, and so uh, the idea that this is a solution, uh, I think does not hold. Uh, we also, therefore, I would argue, and, and this is a, a radical proposal, but I think it's something that flows naturally uh, based on, on the assumptions um, and the facts that we have in front of us, is the idea that uh, we should market Greece. We should try to attract people, we should try to sell the country. I think we should move away from a logic of marketing and move in the direction of a logic of gatekeeping. Um, trying to think of access to Greece as a privilege, not something that is um, accessible to everyone, and trying to regulate it. Uh, not every area, not every beach, not every coast should be commercialized and accessible. We should very clearly put obstacles uh, to places uh, and not just open uh, places to others. And there are a number of ways to do that uh, from you know, the very restrictive to the more um, uh, easily um, uh, deployed from the uh, UNESCO World Heritage Sites to the European Commission's uh, Natura 2000 sites, but also creating natural parks, creating natural forests, areas that are um, less accessible. Uh, I think that's uh, probably the one thing that we can do uh, to maintain um, a way of balance, both from an environmental perspective, but also from a social perspective. Uh, there are other forms uh, of access restriction uh, we can think of. Uh, for example, places that wouldn't be accessible for a certain uh, number of months uh, during a year um, and things of that sort. And there is an aspect which I think is, is very interesting and important, which is the idea of um, infrastructure obsolescence. So instead of trying to modernize roads, airports, and ports, we should actually maintain uh, obsolete infrastructure in order to make it more difficult for people to actually access certain places. Um, the point, again, and this is a, a sort of a function of the mental shift, in order to try to think about how to make every part of Greece more easily accessible to uh, a larger number of people, we have to reverse our thinking. Um, 
I'll give you a couple of examples. There is right now a very interesting uh, sort of thinking going on in two cities in Europe that have experienced some of the most extreme forms of uh, over tourism uh, so far. Barcelona is one. Venice is another. Um, there is uh, Venice has been at the forefront of trying to limit uh, cruise ships. And Barcelona has been at the forefront of trying to limit the number of apartments that are used for uh, hosting foreign visitors as opposed to local people. Uh, another very interesting example is Iceland, which is also extremely desirable. Um, Iceland has made a very, um, I think, a powerful set of moves, both to restrict areas by uh, turning them into natural parks of uh, a variety of different types and sorts, and also emphasizing the idea of not um, uh, sort of enlarging uh, for uh, roads. Uh, some of the most beautiful and most attractive areas in Iceland are only reachable through very um, narrow roads. Um, one of the most interesting examples, uh, and this uh, connects with the, uh, the, the question of, of social exclusion, is the way in which the United States has managed it, its nat national parks. Uh, because uh, I think they provided a very nice balance of protection and access. Um, so in order to visit, for example, Yosemite Park, um, you have to apply. And very often you have to apply in order to get in a lottery. Um, and I think uh, a lottery would be a way to make um, um, desirable places in Greece accessible to Greeks um, after a certain point when um, from a price point perspective that access uh, is likely to be impossible otherwise. Um, so there are a number of ways to think about how to, to manage that, which I think are worth keeping in mind. Um, all of that, of course, requires uh, information, uh, requires, uh, it's part of the mental shift that I've described right now. It requires the ability of society to mobilize at the grassroots uh, and to lobby uh, for those effects. Right now, the sense that politicians have is that people are more interested in um, maximizing the number of uh, visitors rather than um, keeping it stable or even decreasing it. And in order for that to change, that has to happen uh, at the grassroots level. Of course, there are problems here uh, and they're obvious. Uh, there are very strong incentives for more and quicker profits. Institutions in Greece, in Greece are, tend to be weak, especially institutions that are um, tasked with the protection of the environment. Uh, one of the worst institutions in Greece uh, is the zoning institution. Um, uh, they are plagued with uh, a variety of problems. Uh, they are poorly staffed and they're very corrupt. There are famous cases of corruption uh, when it comes to uh, zoning in the Cycladic Islands. There is also a lot of local opposition uh, to uh, processes of restricting tourism. Um, uh, a lot of people don't realize uh, that by making a quick uh, profit, they're likely to lose in the long term. And, and that's part of the process of education that is in front of us. And of course, there's a problem of collective action, which is basically the idea uh, that since um, the benefits of, of tourism and, and the benefits of protecting the country uh, tend to be a public good accessible to everyone, people have no incentive to mobilize in order to prevent that from happening. The idea is let somebody else do it. And as a result, nobody does it. It's the very well known problem uh, of the free rider. Um, I'm going to close by, by uh, pointing to something that's perhaps a bit more original, which um, uh, occurred to me by through my work in, in other um, areas of political science, which is the idea uh, of what may be described as ad hoc institutions, that is using institutions that are not necessarily geared towards producing the desirable effect you have in mind, but which may in fact be used in that respect. What do I mean by that? Um, one uh, institution we, we can use are judges, especially the Supreme Court in Greece has been um, uh, one of the institutions that has been effectively um, very um, positive and, and very effective in, in protecting uh, the natural environment. Uh, even though that's not necessarily uh, its main task, but in general, it has been very uh, responsive uh, to um, citizen initiatives uh, for the protection of environment. And precisely because judges 
especially the Supreme Court in Greece, are not an elected democratic institution, then they tend to be, uh, in a sense, better shielded from pressures from below uh, that are pushing uh, for uh, you know, this, this um, uh, set of incentives that I just described. Another institution which is, uh, has, has the same effect um, are archeologists. Archeologists are very powerful in Greece for historical reasons. Uh, they are not, and they, they are not um, an environmental agency, obviously. Uh, however, in fact, they very often have acted um, as uh, uh, in, in a series of agencies that have put obstacles to the development uh, of, of sensitive areas. So archeologists, I think, uh, are a very important institution in Greece because of their ability uh, through uh, in, in various institutional mechanisms to block processes of development. And finally, I would argue, and, and this is a sort of um, surprising argument to make, that uh, some of the weaknesses of Greece, its bureaucracy, the red tape, the delays and the posturing, uh, we can hijack uh, that in order to um, try to make um, overdevelopment in Greece um, uh, something that uh, is going to, um, in a sense, move move us in, in, in towards bad outcomes, um, because it's difficult, uh, because you have many veto players, you have a lot of different kinds of laws. Sometimes you can actually use that bureaucratic inefficiency. Uh, in order to protect the environment. And in fact, the reason why, for example, Greece did yeah. not become uh, uh, like other um, Mediterranean countries like Spain uh, in the 1960s and 70s, which created and um, overdeveloped a lot of coastal areas in ways that we know now were very destructive with very large hotels. Why? Because of the uh, fragmentation of private property, because uh, of uh, the red tape because of the difficulties in development. So one can actually use something that is traditionally thought of as um, an inefficient part of Greece in order to um, um, protect the, uh, the environment and prevent some of the most negative elements of, uh, of tourism. So I'm going to stop here, uh, give you that as, as food for thought, uh, and we can have um, uh, some Q&A uh, about those issues. Thank you very much. Uh, well, thank you, thank you, Stathi, for a fascinating, uh, fascinating lecture. Um, as uh, I was suspecting, um, I was I was keeping copious notes so that I could do a nice wrap up of what you what you said. But uh, as it happened with your summer article in Gatmeni, uh, the um, yeah, entitled Greece Without uh, Summer, which created an avalanche of uh, responses and questions and remarks. The same thing has happened here. We have, uh, I, I, God knows, more questions we can handle in the time that... Yeah, okay, let me start with uh, Scott Dreher, who says, what does the phrase lower quality tourists mean here? Um, do you want to answer that? I, I imagine <laughs> it's okay. a combination of uh, of um, uh, tourists that spend less and also tend to behave in ways that uh, um, creates problems uh, for others, uh, especially uh, party type of tourists uh, who drink heavily, uh, pollute heavily, uh, and do not spend very much. Uh, that would be the sort of low quality. Uh, tourist. That would be the description of it. Actually, this, the next uh, the next comment, uh, which comes from Thalia Pandiri, uh, answers Scott, <laughs> who says, "I think of the package tours from the UK that I have seen turn Malia and Iraklio, uh, Iraklio area into a circus of drunken, aggressive, littering tourists who combine alcohol and and substances, substance abuse, with frenetic, promiscuous activity, an endless binge brawl and orgy, and these are cheap packages that cost Greece more in the end than any revenue can cover. Um, I think <laughs> I think that uh, answers the question uh, very eloquently. Okay, um, we have uh, Mary Daphne say, please comment on the pros and cons of increasing large cruise ship tourism as well. 
Well, certainly, I mean, that uh, I mentioned that in relation to Venice and how uh, uh, Venice has tried to um, act against the, uh, the presence of very large cruise ships in the vicinity uh, of the city. It doesn't mean that those uh, cruise ships are not going to be uh, available, but uh, one of the problem with cruise ships is also a problem with uh, large um, hotels that uh, used to um, or connect with tour operators. Uh, the, there is a sort of a negative relation between the cost, uh, the cause on the environment, the number of crowds, uh, they disgorge, and at the same time, the amount of the revenue that is not really going to, um, to the local uh, communities. Uh, so certainly one has to think, I think, very seriously about restricting access uh, to that. Uh, I think th there, is, there is a key word uh, that we, st we need to start thinking about, that um, uh, accessing a nice place, uh, given uh, the conditions that, are, uh, that we are able to observe, should not be thought of uh, as for us, you know, selling a product, but also as a privilege for the people who are visiting. Uh, and therefore, we have to think carefully about the balance we want to have between um, those two uh, dimensions. We certainly need uh, the revenue that is generated for the economy, but at the same time, we shouldn't think of only that aspect. Um, Tom Radko uh, asks, uh, what, he has two, two questions, I'll put them one by one. What changes, modifications have occurred in Athens to make it a year-round rather than a seasonal destination site? And, and let me add my own comment here that I, I, I see from, uh, uh, from what we tell our own students about Athens these days that what, what the picture that comes out internationally from Athens is that this is a very vibrant, extremely interesting um, um, city with all kinds of uh, um, cultural manifestations, uh, more theaters in Athens, for example, than anywhere I know in the world. Um, and of course, that goes hand in hand with the creation of new hotels, but maybe you want to comment. Um, uh, I think it's, it's part of the global trend in which people um, can actually take a, a, um, a few days break. Uh, I remember uh, a few years ago, I, I, I went to Sweden to give a lecture um, and the person who was in charge of the lecture was telling me that she was going to Crete for the weekend because it was too cold. Uh, that was not feasible in the past. Now, it, th this is feasible now because the cost of flying uh, is not very high and the technology to identify um, uh, and book a trip is very easy. Uh, so this is a global trend. It's not that Athens itself has managed to generate it. It's a very pleasant, a very vibrant city, as, as you mentioned. Uh, it's already becoming less so because uh, especially the downtown area is becoming overly touristic. Um, but again, as I said, this is not going to deter people from visiting. Uh, if anything, it's going to attract the kind of tourists one does not want to have people who come for just to party and, um, uh, and to change, in a sense, the atmosphere of the city. Uh, and this is something that is, um, is a problem faced by all major European cities, places like Paris, uh, Barcelona, uh, Prague uh, have faced the same kinds of things. Some of them are even more extreme. It's enough to visit Florence to realize the damage that can be done uh, in a city by uh, its conquest by foreign visitors. In fact, Florence today is not a real city, it's a theme park in which most of the buildings are used in order to host uh, visitors. And if you travel outside Florence, you have a set of um, suburbs surrounding it, which are very sad places, unlike Florence, which is one of the most beautiful places in the world, uh, and, and you have the local population, the one that, the, that serves in a sense, not the one that benefits from the income stream, but the one that serves the visitors living in that kind of, in, in those suburbs, which are very sad places. Yes, but then uh, the, the, there's a question about, the same person was asking a question about uh, what's the difference between weak and strong institutions when, as it pertains to your discussion, of the resource curse. I think that's kind of obvious though, that the weak institutions, I mean, Greece is a country with other weak institutions in that area, but you can comment on it. Yeah. 
Well, I mean, there are different aspects of weakness. I mean, one uh, aspect of a weak institution is that it takes time to process, uh, for example, um, the kinds of materials that are needed for investment, right? Uh, but yes. another aspect uh, of a weak institution, it's an institution that is corrupt, that can be bought off. Um, so what I, the, the argument that I've made is that we want to have perhaps institutions that are kind of slow in processing uh, investment plans, because that in, in a sense uh, delays the process of development, but we certainly don't want to have corrupt institutions uh, because then that means that you can uh, bypass uh, any kind of control. You may have the most stringent uh, protection laws, uh, but uh, those laws may not be um, even enforced or applied at all. So that is a very big danger. Um, there is a very good um, uh, experience, I think, in that respect, uh, in uh, places like Tuscany, uh, where uh, the, the institutions have been extremely well developed to protect uh, the environment. But that, of course, again, like every problem you solve generates another one, creates a problem of exclusion, then uh, the area becomes uh, the only people who can actually visit or invest and be very super, the super wealthy. And then the question is, what happens? Um, do we have, as Greeks, I think that's a sort of question we need to ask, uh, a right uh, to access to, to our country's coastline or not, right? So that's something to keep in mind. Good. Um, I, I will. Skip. There's a comment here about the, with rather vitriolic comments about uh, the um, about cruise ships and so on. I mean, this is this is a comment, not a question. I, 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 the, the writer is obviously right in pointing out uh, some of the uh, ill effects of um, um, cruise ship um, uh, vi visitors. But anyway, uh, I, I'll go over that. Skip over and go to the next one, which is. Uh, Italy has been, uh, it's Karen Handley asking, uh, saying, Italy has been working particularly effectively in attracting visitors to less well-known regions of the country by developing different accommodations and experiences. Is there a similar initiative taking place in Greece? Um, there is a, a certainly there, there is a sort of movement from places that receive uh, fewer visitors to try to trying to attract them. Uh, and we are already seeing uh, successful results. But again, as I said before, success also brings with it a number of negative outcomes. I think the best example uh, is the area of uh, Zagori in Epirus, which has become very successful in the last, uh, I would say, five, six years in attracting um, visitors. Um, it is already becoming overcrowded and it's already becoming overexpensive. Um, so there is a limit, I mean, there is a, a point beyond which, uh, again, we see the phenomenon of the benefits becoming oh. to uh, 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 overwhelm, um, to be overwhelmed by, by the negative consequences. My sense is, obviously, if we are moving in a direction in which, say, 10 years from now, Greece will be receiving 60 million visitors, no matter how you spread them, they are going to overwhelm every place uh, that is uh, desirable in Greece. Uh, and as I said, those places are extensive. Greece overall is a very beautiful country, but they're not infinite. Greece after all is a small country. Yes. Um, Dimitra uh, says that the longer season um, is a good idea, that the climate change will, will also help this. July and August are too hot for visiting archaeological sites, particularly from eight to three. Well, we all agree with that. The, uh, and then uh, <laughs> uh, another um, sort of um, aphorism here that uh, what's happening in Greece these days is uh, encapsulated by the Greek phrase, mate skili aleste. Uh, anyway, we move on to Amalia Zepo who says any ideas of where this new mindset will, will come from, the one that you spoke about, Stati, other than individual or small scale initiatives, can you predict the shifting role of local or regional authorities, ministries? And so I think it's a very interesting question, really, who is going to take the initiative here to change the mindset? That's what she's asking. Well, this is a process that takes, you know, that takes time. Uh, it's not something that is going to be uh, top bottom, but rather bottom top. 
certainly I see um, you know discussions like um, uh, those that are taking place right now as a way to alert people uh, when I, I, I like to do um, sort of nice small experiment every time that I meet people I, I sort of tell them that uh, perhaps it's not a good idea uh, to try to maximize uh, the number of tourists people are shocked when they hear that because we've all grown up with this idea that this is something very important for Greece to be able to attract more people. Um, so when you have to shift on, in that respect, it's kind of shocking. But I think so. I think it's important first to begin this kind of conversation, uh, to spread the word, and then people uh, are already realizing that there is a problem. One of the things that is shocking a lot of Greeks these days is the fact that they no longer have free access to beaches. They have to pay in order to be able to go to a beach because there is no space for actually sitting on the sand. You have to actually rent, um, uh, you know, um, it, it, an umbrella with its chair. It's, it's becoming quite expensive uh, to actually access a beach these days. So people um, are going to be, I think, um, more uh, willing to listen to this kind of message and to change their attitudes, given uh, their personal costs, they will have to, um, to pay for it. There's a question about the klimatologio here, uh, which uh, is uh, what has been the impact on tourism caused by the delays in implementing the National Land Registry. Uh, can you think of and yeah, there's a lot of illegal construction, uh, which eventually becomes legalized uh, yes. over the years, and it's been one of the big problems in Greece. But I don't think that has been the biggest problem. In fact, I mean, if we were to look at the Greek coastline over the years, the weakness uh, of the uh, institutions, which I've described before, prevented much worse damage from happening uh, than the... Uh, uh, the illegal construction on, on, on the beach. So I, I don't think that illegal construction is such a big problem. The bigger problem is um, that areas that had been uh, not accessible because of complicated property issues uh, are now being consolidated from a prop property perspective and then being sold as very large plots of lands that allow the construction of very large uh, hotel complexes, uh, which I think... Um, we shouldn't actually try to um, encourage. One of the problems with the legislation currently um, uh, in Greece is uh, the idea uh, that not only you can, um, you should build very large hotel complexes, but you also, uh, you're subsidized to do so. The Greek state subsidizes uh, these investment plans because it is geared towards um, subsidize, subsidizing investment. And I think one of the things that we should uh, try to um, affect in, in the next few years uh, is make sure that uh, Greek subsidies go in directions that are much more needed as opposed to the uh, subsidy of, uh, of hotel building. Yes, uh, there, is a, there is a comment from a, 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 an organization that has been working on, the, uh, on saving EOS from uh, a, a, a certain investment which is uh, apparently hurting the environment there and uh, they're encouraging, encouraging us to look at that and um, uh, it's a, well it's a very difficult um, uh, yeah this is the, the problem of uh, Ineos there's a single individual who has basically managed to buy about 60 percent of the island yeah. and it's building uh, um, not very nice looking hotels um, and restricting uh, access to beaches. Um, so that's that's a, that's quite of a pro you know a, a problem that has received a lot of attention. And he's doing that uh, irrespective of um, um, de decisions of um, uh, of courts, uh, because apparently some of the moves he made were were not really um, legal. Um, so it's a, it's a complex issue, but certainly, uh, what, you know, the flip side of that is that people's attention uh, to these kinds of problems is becoming, uh, is increasing. Uh, a lot of these things are coming to, uh, to public attention, which I think is a good thing. Um, we're getting a lot of, uh, a lot of, as I said, negatives on uh, the, the cruise ships. I will not go over them. 
people are particularly offended by them, apparently. Um, there is a very, there's some very good uh, messages uh, congratulating you, Stanathy, for an excellent lecture. And uh, there is one from uh, a good uh, friend, academic, uh, uh, Professor Pandiri, who pra sings the praise of CYA, uh, uh, especially uh, the students of CYA, and all those who, ha who have come to CYA have returned transformed by the experience in love with the program and with Greece, she says. Well, Thank if you. I may say so, one of the things that uh, we can do is uh, uh, one a powerful ally um, in this um, enterprise um, are uh, non-Greeks who over the years uh, have bought, have a house in Greece, perhaps even because they, they started visiting Greece as uh, CYA, you know, visiting students. Um, and these people very often um, are very attached uh, to, uh, to Greece and to, to the particular place uh, in which they have property. And uh, they're very active, uh, very often more so than uh, Greeks themselves in, in trying to protect uh, uh, Greece's heritage and environment. A key issue is to try not to generate rifts with local people. Very often, it's very easy for local people to perceive uh, that they're being, um, in a sense, um, um, antagonized by foreigners who've bought property uh, and who do not want uh, the area to be developed and therefore um, to restrict the economic benefit that uh, uh, may uh, be attracted, um, may arrive to, to, to local communities. One has to find, I think, clever ways uh, to uh, you know, tell local people that uh, the negatives that are going to um, accrue to them are, are going to often be uh, worse than the benefits that, and that the long-term protection of their place uh, is something that, uh, even from a purely financial perspective, is something that uh, they should be concerned. Uh, people need to be educated. They, they shouldn't be antagonized, I think. And it would be a mistake uh, to um, not to be careful about how one, you know, how we present these kinds of issues. Here, here, where, where's the wisdom? Uh, as you know, I, I have a particular connection with the island of Paros where we're facing this problem with the expansion of the, of the runway of the airport, which according to some of us, uh, for the, the thinking of some of us, of many of us, will be the, ru the ruin of Paros, as it has been the ruin of, of, of Mykonos. Uh, but um, in order to um, get the local community to um, espouse this theory, uh, it takes diplomacy, it takes it tact, it takes kindness and understanding of the fact that these people think that, um, uh, well, well uh, uh, we have to make a living and we have to uh, improve our livelihood and who are you to be telling us differently anyway let me let me take a, 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 a comment by by a, a good friend petros babasikas from uh, vancouver who is uh, who used to be a professor at cya and is now uh, uh, teaching in and 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 ah toronto excuse me not vancouver uh, directly supporting and expanding environmental conservation and linking to tourism planning and building would be fundamental, he says. Expanding and maintaining protected areas too. What are your thoughts, Stathi, on a carbon tax on tourists and building activity that could, for example, return proceeds to affordable, affordable housing? Yes, yeah, certainly that's uh, one of the, uh, the things that has been uh, discussed, not just in Greece, but in other places. That there has to be some sort of uh, um, individual tax. In fact, Italy, for example, uh, has uh, an individual tax. When you go to um, a hotel in Italy, you pay the price and then you pay an individual tax on top of it, which is small, but it's used by uh, the local municipality in order to make it possible uh, to, to deal with the effects. Um, that uh, people's presence uh, pose. So certainly I see that uh, uh, as going in the good direction and we're likely to see a lot of creative ideas uh, in that respect. Um, 
one of the things that I, I also think uh, is going to develop in the future is uh, the not just the uh, imposing a constraint on visitors to give back to the place they visit, but to somehow participate uh, in it and as part of the experience. Uh, it's very interesting to see that um, uh, in places like Southern Italy uh, or, or France, you see sometimes people who are visiting um, local farms, participate in farm jobs. Uh, for example, collective, um, collecting um, olives uh, is becoming part of the experience and it's something that actually helps uh, local people as well. So there are a lot of creative ideas. Uh, there are lots of examples that we can um, inform ourselves from, and, and all of that is part of the process of changing our perspective, shifting our perspective about what tourism is and what it, it should be doing. Yes, uh, we are alre already a few minutes over our time allotted, but um, there is an avalanche of uh, questions and remarks. I'll try to skip over those that have already been dealt with and uh, only mention the uh, ones that I think can add more to the conversation. Uh, there is Dimitri Adonopoulou who says gentrification is an insidious problem, flattening aspects of Greek culture and ethnicity to blandly emulate the rest of the world. Mega resorts and golf courses in areas where water is scarce, scarce are particularly sad. How to prevent this? I think you have spoken about how you prevent these things, but uh, you may want to comment quickly on, on this. I don't, I mean, I couldn't, uh, I agree with these kinds of comments. Uh, there is nothing to add. Again, the question is very often uh, exactly how, how one goes about it, um, given the constraints that exist um, and how, what's the best way um, to articulate these kinds of issues? Uh, because the, the point is not to argue that um, we don't need, you know, Greece doesn't need uh, the revenue. Greece does, but the question is to try to find a way to balance the benefits from the revenue from the costs, which are not as visible uh, and certainly are much longer term. Um, one of the things, for example, that local communities ought to be amenable to is the understanding of how um, things like um, teachers uh, for schools or hospitals um, are becoming super expensive when there is no room to house them, uh, to house teachers. Um, and, and this allows them to understand um, the effects uh, that um, is, is coming to them, that uh, uh, tourism is not a, an activity that only produces um, revenue. So it's, it's a lot of it, uh, it's, I think it's very important to insist, has to do with um, the the packaging, uh, if you if you wish, of, of these kinds of uh, points and and perspectives. Yes, somebody is asking for uh, a link to your Kathimerini uh, article. Uh, uh, yes, and, and I will. Uh, unless you have it, if you have it, you can share it with me, and I'll do it. But I can look it up. I will. I will post it in the chat. Uh, okay. Um, you can actually Google it, but. Um, yeah, yeah, we can. I, I can find it and uh, share yeah. it with uh, with everybody. Are you uh, there is uh, Maria Zembo again? Are you are you aware that there is a current online consultation uh, of the Ministry of the Environment to change land permits in Natura 2000 areas, adding the right to build up to 150 room hotels and up to 100 meter restaurants, square meter restaurants. How does one refrain from this old development mentality? Who to talk to? Local authorities seem too weak even when they try. You know, it's sort of a, a, a call for of agony here. Uh, uh, <laughs> I don't know how much you can help, uh, Sathi, but you, you may I'm trying to. to I, I'm trying to uh, post uh, the link to the, uh, to the piece, uh, but I'm not having a lot of success success um i can only send direct messages it looks like uh, rather than um... i have already posted in the in the chat okay. box so so it's already Thank there you very much. <laughs> yes. um the uh, legislation can be extremely complex uh, there are always new laws being passed one of the big problems in greece is the um um the production uh, of new um, legislation uh, constantly. Uh, 
somebody once said that Greeks produce more laws that they can actually consume, and, and that's probably true. And a lot of these laws create uh, a variety of loopholes that allow all kinds of things uh, to take place. Uh, I think, again, uh, one has to be creative, and one way uh, is to use uh, the proliferation of laws um, as a way to prevent uh, some of these bigger developments, for example, by, by having recourse to, uh, to the courts. Uh, and it seems like, especially the Supreme Court in Greece has been um, very uh, friendly uh, to um, um, ideas about how to protect uh, the natural environment. And um, so th there, I think there are always um, two aspects in these kinds of, uh, of things, and it pays to be creative. Uh, and one needs to think about, um, you know, those those things. Yes. Okay. I I, I think uh, we can conclude the um, uh, the question and answer period here. And uh, I I will not do my duties right uh, as a discussant by um, wrapping up everything and and recap uh, recapturing what uh, Stati has so eloquently said. I will only bring out two things that, that, that from your takeaways, two paradoxes, which for me work um, strangely against the, the idea that uh, we try to promote that this is not, that hyper-tourism uh, really is going to hurt the country. Um, a, 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 one, of your, one of your takeaways, the paradox of uh, that hyper-tourism is not a tragedy of the commons, really, for some people, because it, it, it generates huge revenue. So, you know, what, what, what kind of tragedy is this if it generates new um, uh, uh, huge revenue? The other paradox... If I may uh, respond to that, um, and that's why it's called the tragedy of commons, because even there is another technical term that is very often used in game theory to describe these kinds of situations, which is called the prisoner's dilemma, which is what is optimal for you individually may actually be suboptimal collectively. Mm -hmm. So uh, in a sense, that's the problem. Uh, it's a giant prisoner's dilemma. Uh, you gain from attracting more tourists or more wealthy tourists um, individually and in the short term, but you lose collectively and in the long term. And so the question is how to shift uh, the paradigm from a prisoner's dilemma to something that um, requires cooperation. Uh, and uh, fortunately, these are problems that are well studied and understood. So in theory, there are a number of solutions. The, the question is always how to take the theory and apply it to a very specific context. And I think this is where social scientists can actually help. Mm -hmm. And the second, the second uh, paradox I, I wanted to bring out was uh, your, uh, one of your takeaways again, by, by having fewer tourists, but wealthier tourists, it's not a panacea. I mean, you, you get other um, side effects, which are extreme, uh, also harmful. So that is not always an answer. So anyways, let's stop mass tourism, but let's go to the high level, um, 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 high level uh, jet uh, traveling, private jet traveling tourists. That that also creates a, a set of problems. And um, this is this is actually a very interesting point because um, very I mean uh, the the same people who say that um, traditionally. That is, you know, Greeks who say, "Well, let's attract wealthy tourists." Um, somehow, um, place themselves out of the picture, and now they're realizing that by doing that, they no longer have the ability to access the sea, uh, which is a shock uh, when people realize that. Because after all, the majority of Greeks were not wealthy. Uh, we mm -hmm. had, in a sense, the privilege uh, of enjoying uh, the summer. One of the things that I've done in the context of this research is to look at, at culture. And if you look at literature, you look at music, uh, popular music, uh, poetry, it's incredible the extent to which um, the summer, the sea, the idea of the break or, or the holiday um, had become part of, of Greek culture, have been internalized. Um, I grew up like many other Greeks of my generation with the idea that we had uh, almost um, 
unlimited access uh, to what is you know, the beauty of Greece. Uh, you could actually just jump on a ferry and for very little money uh, camp uh, in a beach that's no longer possible. So that creates a problem essentially uh, of intergenerational justice. We no longer uh, can uh, tra transmit uh, to the next generations the kinds of things that we used to enjoy. Now, I don't want to say that these, these things are immutable. One of the things that's amazing about the Greek islands is that um, back you know, before the 1950s, which is not a very long time ago, they used to be really terrible places. And as you know, uh, in, a, in an island, the kinds of people who inherited land next to the sea were the people, you know, the, the sons and daughters were really the last ones in the chain of inheritance. These were considered the, you know, the least attractive places in an island. And the islands themselves were places of emigration. They couldn't sustain their population. If you go even further, further to the past, islands were um, nightmarish places to live because of piracy. Uh, they were looted, the population was raped uh, constantly. Um, they were not nice places to live. They've become nice places and part of uh, the culture as a result uh, of the same, of the very same technology uh, and economic growth that has caused all these kinds of problems. So there, you know, there is a flip side to that. So the, the challenge for us, and I think, it's very important to emphasize that is not to go back to some sort of idealized past that perhaps never existed, but to actually try to preserve what's best uh, without necessarily losing all the other good sides, trying to find uh, a balance. And that's why I think it's very important to be creative uh, in how we think about that. This is not the kind of topic that's easily amenable from a sort of black and white perspective. One has to be uh, much more sophisticated, if I, if I, if I may put it, uh, in order to try to um, deal with these kinds of challenges. Mm -hmm. um, look, we got, we have to, um, we have to uh, wrap up here and say uh, that I want to finish by paying tribute to the two institutions that you spoke about as um, as protectors of this uh, trend. One is the justice system in Greece, because a lot is said about the justice system, how corrupt it is and so forth. But on the other hand, as you pointed out, the uh, Council of State, the Simulia Picratias, has been probably the biggest uh, protector of, of, uh, of excesses in this area. And the other one is the archaeological service. I mean, they should be both be commended for, for the good work they've done. I, I'm familiar with the island of Simi as well, where the archaeological service has saved the island. Well, almost saved it, but have done an extremely good job in, in preventing excesses there. And the third, um, these, are, these are institutional protectors. The third one is to get Stats Kalivas to become a sort of an apostle of this uh, idea and go from uh, TV station to TV station in Greece and spread the word that the arpachti, as this called in Greek, is not the best solution to um, uh, the, the, the cultural heritage of the country and the uh, welfare of the generations to come. Thank you, Stathi, for a brilliant talk. Uh, the the uh, response has been amazing, as you can see from the chat box. Thank you very, very much to all of you for listening in, and uh, we'll uh, get you uh, back uh, to another lecture very soon. Thank you very much, and good night or a good day. Bye-bye. Thank you very much for the um, invitation, and uh, I hope we can uh, come back to this topic in the future. Very good. Take care. Bye-bye.